everyone, my name is Kate and I am the Sustainability Coordinator for Tea Leaves. Happy Earth Month and welcome to our first virtual event. The idea for the Garden of Secrets first bloomed five years ago when we were approached by the Director of the University of British Columbia Botanical Garden, Patrick Lewis who after seeing a previous tea leaves film asked if we would partner with them to create a short video in support of the garden. Motivated by our belief in continuous learning and desire to pass on a more sustainable world, we expanded the project into the documentary that we will all watch together today. We're in a period right now where it's the responsibility of each person who cares about passing on a, a, a beautiful, resilient, healthy planet to get out on the streets and fight for it. Joining us from Toronto, it's my pleasure to introduce Dean Dory Tunstall. Dr. Dory Tunstall is a design anthropologist, a public intellectual and design advocate who works at the intersections of critical theory, culture and design. She's currently the Dean of Design at Ontario College of Art and Design University. Prior to joining OCAD, Dory held the role of Associate Dean of Learning and Teaching in the Faculty of Design at Swinburne University of Technology in Australia. Mm. While at Swinburne, she established the Master's and Graduate Diploma of Design. Prior to that, she was Associate Director at City Design Center at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and Associate Professor of Design Anthropology at the School of Art and Design at the University of Illinois, Chicago. From the UBC Botanical Garden, we have our dear friends, Douglas Justice and Patrick Lewis. Douglas Justice is Associate Director of Horticulture and the Collections at the UBC Botanical Garden with responsibility for day-to-day -day operations and the living collections. He's an instructor in the garden's horticultural training program and also teaches woody plants in UBC's landscape architecture program. Douglas trained in nursery work and is a lifelong gardener. Next, we are joined by Patrick Lewis, the UBC Botanical Garden director, including the Natobi Memorial Garden. And he is responsible for the leadership and strategic direction of the gardens. Prior to joining the garden, Patrick was the managing director of UBC's Maurice Young Center for Applied Ethics, and he was also on the executive of the UBC College for Interdisciplinary Studies. He's a founding member and director of the North American Japanese Garden Association, sits ex officio on the Van Dusen Botanical Gardens Board of Directors, and is an active member of the American Public Garden Association. Perfect. So panelists, thank you so much for being here with us today. First question, why is it important that we find inspiration and um, look to nature for inspiration there? Um, I mean, I, th I think the way to rethink that question is I, there's never been a time when we haven't been inspired by nature. Um, and then I think they talked about this in the documentary, right? Like our, all our earliest artwork, um, that's been created by humankind were all representations of nature and our relationship to nature. Um, even in today's time, you know, through um, digital technology and all the things that we have as part of industrialization, the, the thing that we most often use it to, to create is um, um, more creative and compelling representations of, of nature. Um, so I think, I think the difference is um, is what we do with that inspiration in the sense that we, before we would use that inspiration to ensure our roles as of stewards of nature. And I think um, what the documentary does a really job, good job of talking about is that there's a way in which we use it to inspire us, but we think of it as an individual, right? Like I'm individually inspired mm -hmm. by this beautiful floral painting, I'm individually inspired. And what we've lost is that sense of like the interconnectivity um, and the sense of, of that, that the way in which nature 
um, not just inspires us or even heals us individually, but is actually interconnected planetarily, interconnected to the very specific context of place and place setting um, and obligations to place that we talk about in terms of indigenous knowledge systems and that it heals us as a whole, right? It heals us as a whole community um, and group of people. And I think, so we've, we've not stepped away from being inspired by nature, but the way in which we act upon that inspiration in terms of that, our connectivity to nature itself and our connectivity to each other, that is what's shifted, but hopefully we'll shift back. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think that the, um opportunity for innovation too I, I think that uh, that uh, that shift back um, you know brings us uh, the opportunity to examine more closely I think about uh, Jazz Paul Badial and um, his uh, lab at Durham University which is in the mentioned in the, the uh, uh, documentary um, had an opportunity to spend some time with Jazz Paul and, and it's quite clear that so many of the innovations that he has come up with have resulted uh, just from the act of observing, you know, actually spending time in nature and uh, around plants. And uh, and Douglas uh, mentioned the, the the water absorption on the uh, uh, the bamboo. And I, I know that uh, you know most of us when we walk by bamboo, we uh, we just walk by bamboo we don't spend a lot of time observing it but uh, you know bamboo has uh, the the bamboo uh, leaves actually have something to tell us about how water is is used and how it's moved and that there's the bamboo leaf is made up of different types of cells some cells which repel water some cells which direct water and uh, and those that some of your structure changes over age so that the bamboo leaf uses water differently and moves water differently over time, which is possibly an inspiration for an innovation which humans could use uh, in a way uh, to, to help move water. So, you know, there is a, um, there is, like I say, as we shift back, like you're saying, Dory, I think that there's a, an opportunity for innovation that, uh, uh, can resolve some really serious issues that we're faced with. And I think um, one of the things that uh, that we possibly don't think about is is that just in our being able to be around plants and to um, to touch plants um, will um, provide us with inspiration. Um, there, there are so many things that are yet to be discovered. Um, you know, every day I walk uh, and look, every day I look at plants and, uh, and I have questions about why things appear the way they do or why they feel the way they do. Uh, and I'm sure in the hands of somebody else, they would have different questions. Um, you know, there are, there are a lot of plants and there are a lot of, um, people who haven't perhaps had an opportunity to study plants. And I think the, the more that we can do that, uh, I think the better off, the better off we're going to be. Absolutely. And, and technology can help with that. Like, um, one of my students at OCAD University, um, Andre uh, Baines, he has a project called The Living Lab. And so he's uh, originally, his family's from St. Vincent. And so he has this project where he's um, trying, he's trying to create in-home uh, ecosystems in which you can grow native, in this case, St. Vincent plants, because you've had to immigrate from St. Vincent's to Canada, um, and you're missing in some ways like the land and whatever. So you, he's using like sensors technology to figure out like, how much humidity it needs and what temperature it needs to, and you rebuild this ecosystem in this contained um, space um, but again as the person you have to learn right you have to learn what are all these things that this plant needs in order to be able to flourish in an environment that's you know it's different from the environment in Canada right and you know it's connected to this environment in St. Vincent and um, and the technology will help you to understand and to be able to see 
what the differences in those environments are and help you become sensitive, right, mm -hmm. to what it is that plant needs in order to be able to flourish. And, and that's, a, and again, there's amazing things that he's discovering in the process of how you build this and how do you create ritual around it. Um, but again, there's a way in which uh, there's a lot of technologies that are coming up that actually in some ways helps us bring us closer um, to the lives of plants so that we can have that deep understanding of how we need to flourish with them, right? <laughs> Culturally, emotionally, you know, sustaining in, in terms of being able to eat an orange that grows only in a particular environment and another environment because its sustenance is actually deeper than the food that it provides, right? The nutrients it provides. Yeah. Yeah. And very timely as well, given that all of us are in a unique situation where we're being forced to stay at home. So looking at ways that we can innovate and bring nature to us at home, I think is, is a wonderful um, solution to that. Um, which brings me to a follow-up question then maybe to expand on that. So given the fact that we are um, stuck in homes and all of us are going to be in very different home situations, that means that a lot of us are experiencing even more uh, limitation to our access to nature. How do you think that's going to change our relationship with nature or connection to it moving forward? And what are some um, pieces of advice or recommendations that you would have with people to maintain that connection? Well, I would, I would hope that, that everyone will be so desperate <laughs> that, that they'll rush out and embrace the first tree they see. <laughs> I suspect I it's not what will happen. <laughs> I think it's safer to hug trees than hug people right now. <laughs> yeah, probably. probably. Um, I, you know, it's, there's a, I, I'm not sure that this speaks directly to your question, Kate, but I mean, there's a lot of, um, a lot is happening. There's a, there's a, there's sort of a, uh, you know, as people look outside and, realize uh, or walk i mean how many of us are actually just locked inside a room i mean most of us do go out and walk and things like that and and experience uh cleaner air and and uh more bird song i mean you know th there's been a lot on uh on cbc um the Canadian broadcast corporations uh, uh talk shows about the amount of birds in the in the communities and and uh, you know we we see that there is a difference, uh, and a lot of people have been talking online about how much they you know desire for this to keep going, and mm -hmm. and uh, you see cities like Milan, which have been so you know devastated by COVID nineteen, uh, you know they're dedicating thirty five kilometers of roadway are being converted over to bike lanes, mm -hmm. uh, and they're widening their sidewalks, and you know it's there are going to be effects, but, you know, the opportunity to sort of hold on to this, to hold on to the good parts of this moment um, are going to be challenging uh, as people move back to work and, and uh, we start firing up our factories again and our sunsets go from golden to red again. And, and uh, it's, it's going to be a big challenge. It's, it's very, uh, you know that this particular crisis this the pandemic has shown us i think just how powerful the force of nature or the forces of nature are and you know we're we're all vulnerable uh, and i think what that does um you know the pandemic is not a good thing but i think it is a good thing that that something like this can show us um you know some humility um, in the in the face of that nature but you know the other thing about the pandemic it it occurs to me that we that in dealing with this we all have to kind of consider how connected we all are we're all connected through the air we breathe and all of those surfaces that we're <laughs> trying to avoid not touching and uh, you know, and how how connected we are with the people that we're close to. We keep thinking about what, you know, what are the consequences of my actions 
of, of being connected. And I think that's a good lesson for us to understand just how connected ecosystems, I mean, and we're part of the ecosystem. Right. My colleague, Andy Hill, you know, pointed out in the film, you know, we are part of biodiversity. We're part of what's happening. And understanding those connections, you know, having a better sense of how we're connected and how other things are connected, I think is going to be empowering. And I think that that's possibly going to be the catalyst for the change in people's views about the world, about how, you know, if we throw garbage, you know, in the forest here, it's, it's not just a isolated event. It, it has an impact on the ecology of that area, which has an ecology, has an effect on the ecology of the, the, uh, the larger area and et cetera. So I think, uh, um, you know, if I can look on the bright side of what is a pretty horrible um, thing that's happening to people, I, I think it's going to shake people up and, and make them understand a little bit more about the natural world. And I mean, like I'm, I'm seeing now, um, now that it's spring, <laughs> that everyone is really craving nature. Um, craving nature in ways that um, um, I think are um, more extreme than just coming out of winter, right? Yeah. It, it's and um, and in some ways that poses a, a challenge um, in terms of like the density of people, let's say, congregating in you know High Park here <laughs> in Toronto. Um, but it also like, you know, one of the first prohibitions that had to be put in place for social distancing was like, don't go to the beach, don't go to the park, don't go to these places, which meant that even in the very beginning, there's a way in which people felt like I need to be connected to nature in order to heal in some ways from all these things that are going on. Um, and I think that's not going to change. I think what we have to figure out, like, again, it becomes right now, the big question is one of density. Like, how do we manage density as people engage in these spaces? Um, and the great thing about, um, again, lots of places where we still have nature is like the density is quite low, right? That you could be in a huge botanical garden, for example, and depending on kind of how you manage the flow in and out that you can actually have, you can optimize the distance that people have from one another um, in order to be able to engage because a lot of these spaces, these natural spaces are actually quite um, broad, deep spaces, right? That you can spread people out. And so I think some thinking and innovation um, will be necessary around this um, in the sense I don't as spring and summer comes it's going to be more and more difficult to um, for people to um, not want to be closer to nature right to not want to be outside um, and we just have to manage the density of that interaction in ways that we haven't had to think about it before you bring up some really great points about our, our built environment and we're seeing more and more people moving to cities than ever before. If we had been able to predict this situation um, when we were designing these environments, how do you think they would have been designed differently? No, oh, wow. Um, <laughs> so just a small question. <laughs> Something really simple. It's Sunday afternoon. <laughs> well, you know, well, clearly, uh, density uh, has a lot, you know, has a lot to do to do with this. But you know, to to Dory's point, um, you know, more trees and more plants. Uh, you know, at least at least that. Um, you know, if we densify the vegetation, uh, 
you know, that at least gives people a spiritual lift. Um, you know, we all need that, uh, you know, and, and, you know, vegetated spaces are, are good. I mean, it, it's not just, you know, good for us spiritually, but, but it's good for reducing temperatures and, and, um, um, uh, you know, making, making cities more livable. Um, and so maybe people are less frustrated with, with a lockdown. I don't know. That, that's a, it's a very difficult <laughs> question to answer. So, you know, we, I, I mean, so, uh, you know, the, the plant species we have around us have been evolving for billions of years and have, you know, as, as um, um, has been pointed out by a number of people have, you know, really, um, through evolution have resolved many of the issues, you know, that we are faced with, um, you know, that relate to water and food security and uh, climate and these things that are just pressing issues. Um, nature has actually uh, resolved these issues. And, and when you look at it and realize that the human species um, you know, we've evolved over time too, but we're relatively new here. And for the vast majority of our time here on earth, we have spent every night with our face, you know, probably five centimeters from the soil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and we have lived with plants intimately. And it's only been in the, the last you know, I, I mean, few thousand years that we've started to separate ourselves out uh, in large numbers. I mean, you know, there was all, you know, 10,000 years ago, there was people who were already living in their palaces, I guess. But I mean, we, you know, we've only, the majority of us have only left the land within a couple of hundred years. Okay. And so, you know, if you look at the microbes inside the human body, mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, as, as someone said, you know, if, you, if aliens came and looked at the planet, they would view this as the planet of microbes. Not, <laughs> I mean, we are intimately connected with nature and in every way, you know, Oliver Sacks, the, the uh, uh, novelist and, and uh, writer and psychiatrist, and, you know, he said uh, New York City's bearable because of its parks. <laughs> Uh, you know, we green space is, is not just important, it's, it's actually part of us. But the thing that becomes really interesting, and we'll see kind of what evolves after sort of, sort of post pandemic is that um, people might move out of the cities. I mean, like the thing that I'm, so again, if you think of the reason why people congregate to the cities is that, you know, you can go to the theater or you can go to the museum, you could go to all these places in large densities um, that um, we know now through in places where we have strong internet connectivity, it's like, I don't have to go physically into work, right? To work anymore. Like there's no way my boss will be able to convince me going forward that I physically have to be in this space to do my job. <laughs> so that um, opens up possibilities in terms of like, well, why can't, if I have enough internet connection, why can't I move somewhere that is more rural or, or forest and where there's less density of people? Um, if we're going to have, like we're gonna have a generation of young people who like won't have the summer concert experience, won't have all these sort of experiences. So their expectations around how you socially engage might be different. Um, so I do think there's some interesting possibilities in terms of like being, to have the freedom in some ways to return back to nature in different ways to sort of be able to de, densify our cities um, so that we we don't have to live as separately um, as um, we have been because we have felt in order to be progressive modern whatever we need to live in these spaces of concrete glass and steel 
Um, and so that's actually, that's going to be a major shift, I think, in people's thinking, which will change the, I think it'll change our patterns of, of how we inhabit space. It'll change our expectations of how we gather. Um, and that will afford, I think, um, uh, again, that shift back to what you're talking about, Patrick, that, that greater connection. Because we're only really maybe like three to five generations as you're talking about from that connectivity. And so people are gardening, people are getting it back. And we may not want to go back to these, ex these sterile experiences of concrete steel and you know, glass um, in the same way. I think I, you know, I agree with uh, a lot of what you're saying, Dorian. I guess my, my, my concern is um, uh, that there are seven billion of us, <laughs> and um, you know, I um, E.O. Wilson's book Half Earth uh, has been quite controversial in the community, and I and I um, I agree with a lot of the criticism of it, but at the same time, his idea that we have to find some way of setting half the Earth aside to be able to preserve the biodiversity we need to be able to live healthy lives uh, and to find some resolution to the social inequality that we face that we face and to be able to you know raise children and have generations to come that we have to set aside some of the earth or find some way of linking together those parts of the earth that uh, allow uh, you know, biodiversity to flourish and he's not, he's clearly not saying just, you know, well, sort of cut North America in half and, you know, the West, that's just going to all be trees. But, um, but my concern is that, that uh, we have to find some way if we're going to, if we're going to inhabit half the earth, if that is, we have to find some way, and, and I'm going to put it on you designers. <laughs> No, you have to find some way of designing the built environment so that it is a sustainable environment. And I think that that's once again turning to, to uh, the natural world. And the example I like is, is the, uh, there's a, I believe it's in Harare, um, the, one of the government offices, or maybe it's the post office there, uh, then they built it, they, they recently rebuilt it, they used the design of a termite mound mm -hmm. uh, for the ventilation system and they don't use any energy and they managed to keep it at a constant 85 degrees day and night uh, just by using the principles that, that uh, termites use to build their mounds. So, you know, there are a lot of solutions in nature and I think we have to find those and bring them in because depending on how you look at it, cities are actually very efficient uh, and can be very efficient and might be, um, might be absolutely necessary. I don't know, but they might. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a very interesting um, uh, story. I, I like that story. It, it, it appeals to me, but, but I think that, you know, when, when you consider, um, you know, who's being served by, by all of these things, I think, you know, we need a pretty uh, severe um, dose of social justice, mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. if, if any of this is, is going to work. And so that's a, that's a whole other, um, that, that's a whole other webinar, I think, but, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I, Just a webinar. <laughs> I am, uh, you know, I am optimistic, as I said before, that I think that, people are starting to, you know, see the world in a, in a different way. You know, I mean, uh, maybe it's too obvious uh, an example, you know, the countries where, uh, you know, where there's socialized medicine, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you know, are generally, I think, doing better, um, you know, with respect to the pandemic. Um, and so I think people are maybe going to wake up a little bit to, to those things. Um, and I think along with uh, a good dose of, um, you know, biomimicry, 
we got this, we've got this solved. <laughs> well, and I think one of the things I, I think to remember is that like, again, in, in a lot of, um, in a lot of indigenous communities, right? And I say globally indigenous in the sense of sort of people who've lived with the land and have the context with the land. It's like they, um, they live and understand and observe nature and build their environment, right? In such a way that it works harmoniously and to some extent to great densities, right? When we think about it, right? So I do think that um, in terms of like learning from nature that we could, should also, I think, the voices that should be forward um, and kind of defining the possibilities of what those relationships should be are the, are the indigenous voices. And again, understanding that they've also been colonized, so it's not like a pure sort of thing, but I do think there's principles and practices um, that have been put in place for um, thousands of years to live lightly on the land that we can definitely learn from um you know and and even in the context of like pandemic it's not like this is the first pandemic that's ever happened on the earth right and so there are ways in which people um have learned how to reshape their environment have learned how to reshape or redesign their social relations um have learned to um in some ways uh move with the land in order to be able to um, to address even these kind of pandemic events that we are experiencing right now, and so there's a lot of learning that we can take um, from these um, from indigenous communities around how to do this, right? How to do this well? How to do this with our humanity intact? How to do this with our relationship to nature intact? Um, and how to do this from a principle of social cultural environmental justice right? yeah I think that I think that's really important and I think that um, uh, um, uh, Kate and I were uh, were fortunate enough to be in uh, Davos at the World Biodiversity Forum in February and and uh, Paul Smith from Botanic Gardens Conservation International was on the panel with us and uh, you know, I, a comment he made about Ethiopia, which I, you know, uh, you know, once again, I, I don't want to be the voice that raises all the concerns here, but, but um, he was talking about this. Uh, there's a, a plan for replanting uh, uh, forests worldwide in a number of countries. I think it's 47 countries have now signed on, and the targets. I'm, Going to pull this out of the air. I think it was around 300 or 325 million hectares of land to be reforested, and and this is an incredible initiative. And you know that 47 or 50 countries would do this, and hopefully all countries in the world would be involved eventually. But the challenge that Paul pointed out was that the when we come up against sort of the capitalist model. Um, in Ethiopia, where they have replanted millions, tens, hundreds of millions of trees. I mean, Ethiopia is one of the sort of uh, benchmarks for what we should be doing. They're actually planting an Australian eucalyptus. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not planting an Ethiopian tree because the eucalyptus has a harvest time of like five years. And um, they need to have that economic flow for the uh, for the countryside, you know, I mean, it's you know, and the farmers, they're embracing. It. This is this is not probably a sustainable endeavor. It's yeah. it's almost doomed uh, to failure from the outset. And yet, the initiative is there, and the initiative should be grasped. And if that had, in some ways, been combined with the knowledge of the indigenous peoples of that area. Uh, it would be a much more robust uh, plan. However, the economic model wouldn't have sustained it. Yeah. Right. I did my PhD research in Ethiopia. <laughs> 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 so I know that story quite well. <laughs> Going back actually to the founding of the city of Addis Ababa, which was founded because, uh, again, they had stolen the eucalyptus, so King Menelik had stolen the eucalyptus trees. <laughs> Uh, and uh, the army had come through and basically denuded 
all of Addis Ababa. Uh, and so they replanted the eucalyptus trees in place. And because they were able to grow fast, that's how it was able to be sustained as the capital of, uh, of Ethiopia. But again, it, it's uh, the eucalyptus is uh, the way it extracts water. So it completely disrupts the water system in Addis Ababa and thus makes it actually very harmful um, to, to that for growing basically any other thing except eucalyptus in that environment. And same in the countryside, it's very disruptive in the countryside. Ethiopia is a perfect example of the need to, uh, to protect biodiversity for human health and, and, uh, and food security. Uh, the, the seed banks of the world um, uh, have benefited from Ethiopia Mm -hmm. And it's the, the variety of grains that are grown. Uh, I haven't been there, but I gather that it's, it has something to do with the topography of the country. Uh, the grows just a staggering variety of grains, which the world will need. Yeah. Well, well I spent part of the summer, sorry, in um, uh, Colombia, and there's a program called um, Maria de Montes. Uh, which is a collaboration by a company called um, Crepes and Waffles um, and local community where um, they're reintroducing biodiversity into this re region, um, uh, Maria de Montes, uh, which was deeply affected by the Civil War. And they're replanting beans and um, squash and setting up uh, bee um, aviaries and all of these sort of corn, which are again sort of are indigenous to that area um, and very hardy. Um, and uh, what the company does is that they buy then whatever is grown um, by the farmers and then at above market prices. <laughs> and then use that in all of their ingredients in their chain of restaurants. Um, and so to me, that's an interesting model of like how capitalism yeah. in some ways works really well with sort of an ecological uh, rebuilding of biodiversity for an ecological system um, in ways that allows biodiversity to flourish both in terms of training. So there's a group of sort of farmers who train other farmers um, and how to be more biodiverse and organic in the way in which they do that. But it's also, again, there's an economic model that works well with, with capitalism that would then allow this to flourish in a different way. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a, that's a great um, example. I think, unfortunately, the industrial forestry in the, in the world is mostly, in the tropics, is mostly based on eucalyptus. And I think we have a long, a long way to go. I, I'm again. I'm optimistic because I think with education, um, you know, governments can be educated, and um, and I think that we'll we'll start to make inroads as we have with with forced companies in Canada. Yeah. On the topic of education, we are starting to run to the end of our time today. <laughs> I want to make sure that we acknowledge the questions from our wonderful audience. So actually building off of the point that you just mentioned, uh, Douglas, there is a question from Chris and Suzanne Finch, who are asking, um, are schools starting to incorporate the ideas into their curriculum? And um, I, I think just speaking to that role of education in, in general would be wonderful. Well, I, I think, uh... Um, Patrick and I know know the Finches well. It's nice to hear from them. Um, and I and I I couldn't say specifically about say K to twelve. Maybe Patrick has a uh, has some insight there. But I know that uh, university um, forestry faculties uh, curricula uh, curricula in in those departments have changed uh, fundamentally. In the in, particularly in the last few years, and forest ecology, I think it has a much greater role in uh, in you know how how people can now understand what's happening in in forests. So I mean, it's not perfect, but I think uh, we're we're starting to see some movement uh, in the right direction. I can say at OCAD, sustainability is our third of our principles in our academic um, an academic plan. 
Um, I think, again, from an art and design institution perspective, I think we, at least we've had a strong focus on sustainability for at least the last 20 years. Um, uh, I think what, what's happening now in our curriculum is that we've, we've talked a lot about sustainability principles. Uh, we've, um, we've worked very hard to make sure the materials that we use, that we teach with and that our students use are, are sustainable um, and have very long discussions around um, how do we make sure that um, the materiality of what we do um, is not minimize its disruptiveness is probably the best way to say it to nature. Um, the thing that we're sort of working on now is that we have, we have the theories, we have the materiality. What we don't have is in some ways the living labs to demonstrate if you do this, if you build a, a, an environment this way, if you build a built environment this way, um, and you build in these principles and building these materials that we can prove to you that it would have these outcomes, that's the part I think we're missing in our education is like the proof of concept in a way that helps us as an institution be more effective as a, um, as a site to convince others that this is possible um, and this is what the outcomes look like. So we're more persuasive um, in helping to shift the entire um, ecosystem and the industries that, that our students are able to feed into. So I think principles we have, we are there. We've been teaching the principles for 20 years. I think the practices in terms of like the choices that you make, we've been there very much so in the last, I'd say, uh, 10 years. Um, I think what we're missing now is being able to really demonstrate the proof of concepts around how you actually build a sustainable environment. How do you practice jewelry making in ways that are sustainable? How do you practice, um, how do you build products that are sustainable in these particular ways um, that have an impact, right? A greater impact on the entire ecosystem. That's the part where we, um, where we need to do more work as an institution. And, and maybe part of that is having the partnerships to be able to demonstrate um, that in a significant, um, impactful way. Yeah, I mean, uh, UBC has uh, uh, sustainability as one of its main pillars. And uh, it's done a lot of work uh, over the past, oh, it would be Douglas, 15 years now? Um, uh, and, you know, embracing the concept of uh, campus as a living lab, Tori, which I guess is, you know, trying to, trying to find that, uh, that component that you uh, pointed out is missing. And, uh, and I think in some cases it's been very successful. I, it's, uh, it's definitely something that the university uh, needs to pursue. And um, it, uh, there has, I think that that mindset has changed uh, curricula on campus in a lot of places, like, you know, pointing out forestry and, and the rise of urban forestry at uh, UBC, which is um, quite a, a dynamic course. And, and uh, even the, the rise of the, the uh, Biodiversity Research Center and uh, in the Faculty of Science, uh, you know, these are, I think, all tied to that. Uh, but there's way more work to be done. Thank you all so much for um, your responses to that question. Uh, another question we have from the audience uh, from Carly. We saw so many Earth Day and Earth Month pledges, which seem to happen more and more, and so it's harder to tell what is real. Any tips on not falling for greenwashing? And this was uh, specifically for Dory, um, but of course, Douglas and, and Patrick, if uh, you have insights to share as well, more than welcome. I want to know what she's got to say about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, luckily, um, I teach uh, the research methods, one of the research methods courses, and luckily one of uh, my, uh, a group of students had taken this on as a project, actually, because they they are highly aware of the sort of greenwashing. And I mean, the only way around it is really is to do the research, right? To be able to follow the trail of where this product 
are the service comes from, who's his serve, what's his, what's his labor practices, is it practicing social justice, how is it sourced, how, what's the distance between those sources, is it using slave labor? So it's no other way around it except to do the research. Um, um, and, and again, I think, you know, if you have a close relationship to the brands, let's say that you are using, then you'll, you'll know, right? You'll know. Um, you'll know whether they're true, you'll know whether they're um, false, you'll know even in some ways they may start out as greenwashing, but due to your own consumer pressure, um, make that uh, greenwash really real and true in the way in which they practice. So I think being a, um, an informed and responsible um, consumer who uses their um, advocacy to build the world and the values of the world that they believe in like that's the that's the only way in which you keep companies accountable um and uh and it's a lot of work <laughs> uh to do the research and there's apps and things that are actually being developed to kind of help you out um you know there's apps around how to know if your products um is being built by slave labor there's apps around identifying actually how much water there is in the product that you're using so that you can reduce use water. So there's a lot of work that's being done, mostly by young, um, young uh, students and recent graduates that are trying to help us be more informed um, stewards of, of, of the land and our relationships through what it is we purchase. But unfortunately, you can't get away from doing the research and learning for yourselves um, what's the relationship you have to the brands that you purchase, unfortunately. And we talk about it in the series as well. Uh, but for me personally, there was definitely that learning period when I first joined Tea Leaves and we were really looking into our sustainability practices and how to make them better. And it's very easy to think that there are simple solutions out there, but there really aren't. And there's a lot of great steps that you can do. And I think if your effort and energy is in the right place, that's all really positive. But there's a lot of pieces that are part of a, a huge puzzle. And we can't look at one thing in a silo. You have to look at all those interconnected parts, um, small and large, and how they interact together. We definitely feel very fortunate to have such amazing people such as yourselves in our um, community that we can learn from. And um, personally, I would also say that to our participants, participants as well is if you're unsure, look to experts, uh, academics, scientists, um, people who you know really care about it and uh, they can often point you in the right direction and help guide that research and thinking. So thank you very much, uh, Dory, for that. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, um, Patrick, Douglas, Dory. Thank you. This was an incredible panel and we appreciate you spending your Sunday with us. I, I think a big theme of what we were talking about was there is a silver lining to be seen with this, how nature is really reawakening and um, the air is cleaner, the water is clearer. So let's not forget, let's learn from this and let's build a stronger future together moving forward. So thank you for setting us up so nicely to do that. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you, Dorian. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you, Kate, for great moderation. <laughs>